Don Manuel from Venice. You know. <laughs> yes, I'm very happy that this year he could return, so I rescheduled him from the first year to the second year, so everyone who expected him to come last year, here he is, the street philosopher from New York City, from San Francisco, and actually from Mexico, you know, he does not need any degrees, but is still now Dr. Manuel de Landa, and you all have been influenced by his writing, and you know his Deleuzean background, but it is so strongly influenced by his own view and his own thinking that this is always a pleasure to have him here and see what he has done in the meantime. Please welcome my Hello, everybody. Well, tonight I want to, uh, I want to talk about metaphysics. Metaphysics has become a dirty word in the sense that many philosophers use it as an insult. Right? If you're a philosopher, you don't like something, you can always say, oh, that's just pure metaphysics. As if somehow that was an insult. It is not an insult. Metaphysics, for Aristotle, meant it was a synonymous of ontology, that area of philosophy concerned with being. What kinds of beings populate your world as a philosopher? Or what kinds of entities? Are you committed to assert they exist as a philosopher? So your ontological commitments are the most basic presuppositions of your philosophy. A presupposition is, of course, those things that you take for granted, your assumptions, the things that you are not going to explain, but on the basis of which you're going to explain many other things. Any philosophy has to have presuppositions. Any science has to have presuppositions. When you look at, a, at the most scientific mathematical model made by physicists, and you begin questioning certain aspects, well, they'll say, oh, well, we are just taking that for granted in order to explain something else. Well, those are your presuppositions. And so ontological presuppositions or ontological assumptions are the most basic because they involve commitments. Once you commit yourself as to the existence of a certain type of entity in the world, your entire philosophy needs to be coherent with that commitment, with that assertion. Now, historically, there have been different kinds of ontological commitments. The Aristotle, which is uh, one of my heroes, uh, he was what is today called a realist philosopher. That is somebody who believed that the world exists independently of our minds. He did not use that expression. He used the expression, the world subsists. But to say that something subsists is, is to say it subsists or it still exists even when we are not looking at it, even when there is no human being paying attention to it, even when it's not, a, it's not being part of anyone's uh, consciousness. It subsists despite the fact that no one is being conscious of it. But subsist as a verb means exactly the same thing as exist independently of our minds. Now we need, just need to clarify that expression really fast because I may use a few examples from social science and I would not want to confuse you. In social science, regardless of where you're talking, you're an urbanist or a sociologist or an anthropologist or an economist, you're going to be talking about entities like cities, countries, organizations, institutional organizations like uh, industrial corporations, hospitals, universities, you're going to be talking about communities, and as a realist, you would want to say those things exist independently of our minds, but that would not be the right expression, because if all the minds in the world disappeared, all the human minds disappeared, every city would stop working immediately, that is, it would just be populated by zombies walking around, the infrastructure of the city, the, the, what we might call the physical aspect of the city, would still be there, but it would be just a dead exoskeleton. The city would not be alive. Hospitals, universities, prisons, barracks, factories, you name it, any institutional organization would cease to exist at that very moment. The building would still be there, the computers would be there, the desks would be there, but it would be a dead organization. 
communities would disappear, countries would cease functioning. So in the case of social entities, realism needs to be stated differently. We can say that communities, organizations, cities, countries, and many other social entities exist independently of the contents of our minds, which is basically just to say that a city has its own dynamics and we may be wrong about those dynamics. In fact, urbanists to this day do not exactly know how cities work. Do not, cannot exactly tell you just exactly why this happened to this city at this particular time. Where our theories are getting better, but cities are still a little bit of a mystery to us. Communities are still a little bit of a mystery to us. What exactly generates solidarity? What is the critical threshold beyond which a community is not as solidarity as before? What makes a community cohesive as opposed to dispersed? Well, we're still answering those questions via network theory, which means that communities have a being, and the contents of our minds may be wrong about what that being is. So it's not a big claim, but it is a claim, and it is a commitment. Now, when it comes to mountains, clouds, stars, solar systems, viruses, bacteria, atoms, molecules, we can say, Definitely that if you're a realist, you believe that all those things subsist, as Aristotle would say. That is, they exist independently of our minds. Notice that this is not a big claim either. All it is to say is that the human species is historical. That's all it means to say. That there was a time in this planet when there were no humans. Sometimes we, we use the word six, the, the term six million years ago, because six million years ago, Homo erectus and Homo habilis and certainly Homo sapiens were not here. And so there was a time when there were no humans on the planet, the human species is historical. And then we had to ask ourselves, what was there when human beings were not here? When we're not in this planet? Were there already ecosystems with complex food chains and, and birds and plants? Well, yes, there were. Were there microorganisms and viruses and bacteria? Well, maybe not the same ones that we have today, but yes, there were. Was there a solar system six million years ago with the planet Earth moving around the sun and Mars moving around the sun? I would dare to say, yes, it was. Was there a climate system and ice ages and so on? Yes, there were. So there was a lot of things that existed and went on through their dynamics despite the fact that there was not a single human being around to be conscious of them. So it's not a big claim. Nevertheless, being a realist in the 20th century became, almost, with exception of Marxism, of course, Marxists as materialists were always in the fight against idealism and even against empiricism, defending the rights of, of the material world, defending the rights of the, of, the, of the body, particularly the bodies of workers and their labor. But as Marxism waned, as, as its social projects did not deliver and people became disenchanted with it, idealism, which is the position or the ontological commitment according to which human beings are needed for this world to exist, that is the world that's not independent of our minds, began to flourish. And in the second part of the 20th century, most realist and materialist philosophers basically disappeared. Even those who we might think were materialists because of what they were writing, like Michel Foucault, who wrote about prisons and wrote about torture and wrote about a lot of carnal, embodied stuff, he hesitated. He hesitated several times in his writings. He couldn't really assert whether this were indeed things that were independent of our mind, or they were being constructed by society. And so, it is not, he's, not, he's equivocal about it. In, in the book that he wrote about Foucault, Michel, a, 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 a Gilles Deleuze, he, he, he doesn't quite classify him, classify him as a Kantian, but he comes close to say Foucault was a Kantian, which is another way to say he was not a realist. So once realism began to disappear, the word metaphysics, became an insult, because to say anything about the world as it exists in itself was pure metaphysics as an insult. Now, 2,500 years ago, the word metaphysics was not an insult. It was a technical term, and it meant exactly the same thing as ontology. I would suggest that we bring back the word to where it was before. 
Let's stop using it as an insult. Let's just, let's just speak about different types of metaphysics. Gilles Deleuze, the philosopher that I have written the most about, is, I would argue, a realist philosopher. But he's a realist not only about actual things, that is, that table, this person, this building, and New York City right now that I'm not being conscious of it, He's also a realist about virtual entities, and that involves more, uh, you know, harder to defend ontological commitments. Let me give you a, a very concrete example to distinguish the actual from the virtual. It is going to be as concrete as possible. Think of a, an inanimate object that, that inhabits our homes and our kitchens, a knife, a kitchen knife. That's a familiar enough object that we don't really have to think too much about it. Now, any kitchen knife in your table has a certain number of properties. Right? It has a certain length, the handle has a certain color, it has a certain weight, it's made out of a certain material, and, in, and most importantly for its ability to, to act as a knife, it is sharp or, in some cases, it is not sharp. Now, all of those properties I would argue, are independently of our minds, but they are, at the same time, actual properties. Right now, this second, this knife is either sharp or is not sharp. And how can you tell with, cut it and then look at the cross-section of the blade. If the blade is triangular or pointy, then the knife is sharp. If the blade is not triangular, that is, if it has become blunt, well, then the, the knife is not sharp right now as a matter of actual fact. On the other hand, and this is something that Deleuze took from Spinoza and from Leibniz, in addition to properties, things have capacities. In this particular case, think of the knife, capa the, the, the knife's capacity to cut. Now, that is as real as it's being sharp. And in, and in fact, it depends on its being sharp. A, a, a knife that is not sharp cannot cut. But to have the capacity to cut doesn't define anything actual. You may have bought the knife just last night, put it in the kitchen drawer away from, from, from anything else, and then forgot that you bought it. It's Fifty years later, you die, people sell your, your, your possessions, that knife is still there new, it never caught anything. He never actually cut anything. Does that mean that its capacity to cut was not real? Well, that's not true. It always had that capacity to cut. It just never became actual. So Deleuze, following Spinoza, following Leibniz, makes a big difference, a, make a big distinction. In fact, Aristotle made it too, with different words. He talked about potentialities between properties that are always actual and capacities that can be virtual. Virtual defined, very specifically, as being real, but not actual. Clearly, it's not the same meaning that the word has when we speak of virtual reality. That's a derivative meaning. This is a real virtuality that we're talking about here. The space of possibilities associated with a particular utensil. Now, notice how different the capacity to cut is from uh, 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 the property to be sharp. First of all, the capacity to cut can, can become actual, but when it becomes actual, that is when the knife is actually cutting something, it is always as an event, never as a state. Being sharp is a state, which is why it's always actual. It endures. Cutting is an event, an event that happens to something which is being cut. A piece of cheese, a vegetable, a fruit, a piece of meat. And, and as, an, as an event, as, and as Deleuze says in Logic of Sense, and I believe he took this example from the Stoics, the event is always double, to cut and to be caught. You can never cut something without something else being caught at the same time, as part of the same event. So it's a double event. That's already a very interesting ontological or metaphysical point, because we're now talking about the differences between the actual the actual and the, and the virtual. Number two, the capacity to affect of the knife, that is its capacity to cut, has all, I mean, it depends on point number one, but it, it extends it. It needs to be exercised with something that has the capacity to be affected. In other words, my knife has the capacity to cut, but I can only exercise that capacity 
with vegetables, with fruits, with a piece of meat, with a piece of cheese, with something that has the capacity to be cut, to be affected by a knife. The knife cannot exercise its capacity to cut in front of a block of titanium, not even if it's a Ginzu knife. <laughs> Which means that capacities are always relational. And that opens up capacities to a, an entirely different space than properties. Properties can be listed in a piece of paper. You can take the properties of the knife, its weight, its color, its shape, its length, its sharpness, and eventually you run out of properties. Capacities, you may end up with an infinite list, or at least a list that you, you can never finish. It might not be infinite in the mathematical sense, but it, because it can interact with all kinds of different things, and what its capacity is will depend on the capacities to be affect of other things. So, for instance, my same knife here has the capacity to cut with, in, in interaction with a, with a fruit, but it also has the capacity to kill in interaction with a human, right? Or with an animal, with something that has the capacity to be killed. Now, to cut and to kill are entirely two different things. And nothing has changed in the knife that has made its, 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 the, the space of possibilities associated with it larger except that we brought something else, not a knife, with the capacity to be affected by the knife. Now think of all the different things that you can do with a knife, not only all the different types of cutting, chopping, peeling, uh, shaving, and so on, but original uses of a knife. You're going to finish your relationship with your girlfriend, you don't want to send an email, you don't want to finish the relationship in, in, in text, so you you pen a very threatening note, it's over, I hate you, and you pin it to the door with a knife. Now that's going to send a message. <laughs> now, not that I have ever done that, by the way. Not that I've ever done that. But the point is that you can, make, you can use the knife to threat. Now, that is not something you could have guessed from the knife itself, except, of course, he has the capacity to cut, has the capacity to kill, maybe because of that has the capacity to threat. But the point about capacities that I'm trying to make right now, and this is something that Spinoza had already seen, is that they might form an infinite list. Because we don't know in advance how many combinations of affecting and being affected can there be. Whereas properties can be listed and you can forget about it. So capacities to affect and be affected, which Deleuze calls affects. Not my favorite choice of term, he tends to uh, uh, shorten phrases like capacity to affect and be affected, which I, I, I agree is a little long, into uh, shorter terms to pick up speed, as he says. A lot of his philosophy is about thinking rapidly and moving from one point to another rapidly before you get bogged down into details, which would uh, you know, add to the viscosity of the text and, and wouldn't let you move fast enough. So he wants to move fast, we will see in a second that, that he has a point there about the relationship between thinking and speed. But sometimes, and I'm not sure this works as well in French as in English as in other terms, and so you know, I'm not sure to what extent this is a, this is a, a, a translator's a, a, a fault. The word affect, for capacity to affect and be affected, is confused by most people with something emotional. Affectivity. Now, Having the capacity to be affected emotionally, having the capacity to be affected by a sad movie and cry, having the capacity to be affected by a funny movie and, and, uh, and, and laugh, having the capacity to be affected by a suspenseful, mo suspenseful movie by being filled with anticipation, certainly is one type of capacities to be affected. And the loss of those capacities certainly makes you less human. Once you begin to not to be able to be moved by a movie or by a poem or by a song, uh, you have lost something important. You, even if it, 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 capacities to be affected are not passive, as the list reminds us several times. They are every bit as active as capacities to affect and every bit as cherishable, particularly to artists, because your capacity to be affected by the world in different ways is going to mediate your capacity to then affect the world through your works of art. So he reduced the term, the, 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 the phrase rather, to a single term, affect. But I, I ask you to, when you're reading the list, 
expanded to capacities to affect and be affected. You will see how many of those paragraphs make a lot more sense, particularly when he's talking about, for instance, metallic affects in the chapter on the nomads in, and when he's also talking about blacksmiths and metallurgy as a craft and so on. He talks about metallic affects and unless you think of affects as capacities to affect and be affected, you start thinking that he is starting to ascribe emotions to uh, metallic objects, which will, would, of course, be ridiculous. So the list offers us a new ontology, which is enriched, which is not an actualist ontology. So he's a different type of realist. Now, what I want to do today is, is give this little informal introduction that I just gave a little more technical backbone because ultimately that's what everything hangs on. A philosophy will last into future generations if he has a very good technical backbone, even if some of the details turned out to be wrong, even if some of the examples turned out to be badly chosen. That strong backbone, even, a, even a, as it itself changes, can carry a philosophy forward. So let's try to then do that. And who best to compare the Luther's ontology to the original realist philosopher, Aristotle. Aristotle is perhaps the most influential realist philosopher of all time. He's, the categories that with which he thought about realism, about that mind-independent world, or about that world that subsists independently of us, continue to be well with us, the general and the particular, and they have in fact become part of our everyday vocabulary. Today we talk about, you know, this is more general, this is more specific, or, uh, as, if it was, as if they were not technical terms. Well, in Aristotle's time, they were technical terms. Technical terms in metaphysics. Technical terms in an ontology. Now, let me just add this to here. Slightly better. Aristotle begins the, the metaphysics, well, not the beginning of the book, but the beginning of this discussion, by telling us how he's going to divide the world. He says, we want to talk about things that subsist, but there are two ways of subsisting, as he says. One can subsist accidentally, or one can subsist necessarily and eternally. Now, you know, in, we, as individual persons, subsist or exist accidentally in the sense that if a different sperm had reached that egg of the millions of sperms that day, this one particular one happened to reach the egg and you are here. Had there been a little delay and that, and that sperm had just stopped, you know, to take a drink or something, well, then another one would have passed by and you would not be here. That's how contingent and accidental you are. And he says things that subsist accidentally cannot be the object of philosophical thought. I'm going to explain why in a second. So then he introduces two more categories for things that subsist necessarily. And he says, these are the objects of metaphysical speculation, genera and species. The two categories, the general and the particular, a general category of which these are particular members, obtains between each pair of these terms. In other words, individuals are particulars relative to species, species are particulars relative to genera. It's just that by the time we translate it into English, it gets a little mangled there. And he says, only those things that subsist necessarily can we think about metaphysically. Why? Because those things that exist necessarily can be subject to pure thought. In other words, to a we can derive a priori truths about them. And Deleuze, and Deleuze, Aristotle, wanted to build a metaphysics based on a priori truths. Every philosopher ultimately wants some kind of a priori, because the opposite of a, a priori is a posteriori, that is, knowledge for which you offer evidence about it. But as Aristotle says in that very same quote, that knowledge for which you need evidence, that's for physicists. And he says it like that, that's for the science of physics. Not even mathematics can reach this a priori. We need a first philosophy. We need something that comes before mathematics and physics. And to him, that was logic. Because 
First of all, he invented deductive logic, right? The very first piece of software that ever did, or the very first algorithm, since they didn't have computers back then, an algorithm, remember, is just an infallible mechanical recipe. Today, we run those infallible mechanical recipes in computers because computers are so stupid that if you don't tell them exactly what to do, they won't do it. So algorithms, mechanical recipes that are infallible, are, are valued by the computer scientist community. Aristotle invented the first algorithm for deductive logic. It's called the syllogism. And it was so impressive that Kant and Hegel dedicated entire chapters, so particularly Hegel, to the syllogism. Remember the syllogism. All humans are mortal. Premise number one. Socrates is human. Those are the two things that you feed the, the algorithm as an input. And the algorithm automatically, without doing anything else, mechanically will output Socrates is mortal. Now, that might not be very impressive, right? All humans are mortal, Socrates is human. Well, we already knew that Socrates is mortal. But that's only because I'm giving you an example with two premises. Now try that one with 30 premises, some of which are false. And let's see if you can run it in your head. I doubt you can run it in your head. And yet the syllogism could do it. In other words, it's a good piece of software. It actually works. But it actually works for one reason. Deductive logic is the simplest thing to mechanize. Because it, all it does, it moves truth and falsehood from general propositions to particular propositions. Remember that a proposition is the meaning of a declarative sentence. It's, it, a proposition is what the sentence snow is white has in common with a Spanish sentence la nieve es blanca. The two mean exactly the same thing. Well, that meaning that they both have in common is what is called a proposition. So I'm going to talk about propositions, not sentences, because it is propositions that are true or false, not sentences which are mere grammatical entities. So, for Aristotle, he had invented a piece of software, he had invented something that could transmit reliably truth from general sentences to particular sentences. It's called deductive logic. And to this day, we still use deductive logic. Karl Popper when uh, uh, one of the most important uh, 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 philosophers of science of the 20th century went out of his way to say only deductive logic should be used in science. Now we're talking about 1950. So that's a good 2,500 years in which, in which Aristotle's algorithm was already, you know, not only lasting, but being used and being respected. Uh, the opposite of deductive logic is called inductive logic. And it does the opposite. It moves truth from particular propositions to general propositions. Let me give you an example. Let's assume that you are, I mean just to fit my example, a pirate that just discovered a treasure and you're surrounded by jewels and you go, this emerald is green. That's a particular sentence, a particular proposition. This emerald is also green. This emerald is green. All emeralds are green. Now that's inductive logic. You're going from the truth of a bunch of particular propositions to asserting the truth of a general sentence. Now, to make a long story short, no one, no one has discovered an algorithm, a way of mechanizing inductive logic. And that shouldn't be a surprise, because if someone mechanizes inductive logic, that is the same thing as mechanizing the process of learning from experience. This emerald is green. This emerald is also green. This, you're learning from being exposed to a bunch of particular cases and then you're generalizing from experience, which is precisely what learning is. Clearly, roboticists and many people in artificial intelligence would be very, very happy to have an algorithm for inductive logic. It continues to be the holy grail of artificial intelligence, by the way. But it still operates within this paradigm, within this model and within this ontology. Because that doesn't make it any less important. It's just, you, one wonders whether logic should be the basis of philosophy, as opposed to, say, mathematics. I mean, if we're going to need a formal basis for the backbone, should we pick logic or should we pick, pick math? <coughs> now, conclusions. So, 
Uh, in my version of things, and again, he never said that, Deleuze de does deal with Aristotle in difference and repetition. Uh, I, I, when he makes the history of the concept of difference, he has to include uh, Aristotle, because Aristotle would move from genera to species by a series of differences. And then he also has to include Hegel in that discussion, because contradiction or opposition are, can be seen as a form of difference. He writes extensively about it, but he doesn't exactly put it this way. So this is my argument, but I, I would claim that it captures at least part of what the list meant to say. Let's go now to the argument after all the disclaimers. <laughs> The loss replaces the general and the particular with the universal singular and the individual singular. Two entirely different categories. The universal singular basically it comes from mathematics. I'm going to explain the history in a second. The individual singular comes from a variety of sources. In, in fact, it was already in Aristotle. It's his lowest category here, but it has now been raised to something more important. Let me then give you, let me illustrate this with concrete examples. When Aristotle thought about animals, living creatures, he so, said, well, the genera is animal, as opposed to say plant, the species is horse, and the individual is, you know, I can't remember right now the name of an actual horse, so I'm going to use the name of the horse by, what's his name? Ray Rogers. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, Silver. Here, boy, have a carrot. That is, of course, an individual horse. And Aristotle said, you cannot do philosophy about individual horses. Not even Mr. Ed, right? You can't make philosophy about horses in general and animals in general because they have always existed. Clearly, Aristotle did not believe in evolution. How could he? He was thinking 2,500 years ago, for God's sakes. Nevertheless, he had a, a, an algorithm, a piece of software, that would take you from animal to horse in a, in a mechanical and in undisputable way. All you have to be doing is making differences. First, animals with feet versus animals with no feet. Then among the animals with feet, animals with human-like feet with toes and animals with hooves. And so you kept making those divisions until you reached a distinction that was entirely accidental. For instance, a foot with a toe missing. You cannot really use that difference because it lost the toe in an accident. That's just an accident, right? Whereas for a horse, having limbs with, with you know, extremities and the extremities being with a, 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 a dangling toe and mostly no toes is necessary, as far as Aristotle was concerned, to be a horse. And since he's trying to capture that which is eternal, eternally true, then it is at the level of genera and species that eternity or eternal truths lie, and those are the things that philosophers should concern with. Individuals, we cannot do philosophy about. We know they exist, because every human is different, but nevertheless, we cannot do philosophy about that. Now, let's, let's take that little term here, species, as a, an eternal category. This, of course, assumes a fixed world, a world that does not change, a world without becoming, in which horses have always existed. Now that's a perfectly thinkable world before Darwin, right? And it's, it's still a perfectly thinkable world for a lot of people who believe in God, at least the biblical God. Nevertheless, for people who have grown to believe that Darwin was right, not necessarily in every single detail, but at least in the historicity of species, a species is not an eternal category anymore. A species is, in fact, an individual. Not an individual organism, of course, because a species comprises many individuals, like a human species, but a, a, a historical entity that has a date of birth and has at least potentially a date of death. The date of birth for any species, not only the human species, is the, is the process of speciation. Speciation occurs when a reproductive community stops being able to exchange genes with another reproductive community. Imagine a, a particular species of animal, say zebras, and imagine that they inhabit a particular plain, a particular savanna in some place in Africa. And there's a river going nearby uh, that for thousands of years has flown in a particular direction. Suddenly, a geological event 
eruption of a volcano, an earthquake, something like that, makes the river change course in such a way that now it passes right in the middle of a reproductive community and now it separates half of the reproductive community on one side of the river, we are assuming that these are animals that can swim, half of the reproductive community on the other side. Now they will begin to diverge. Now after a hundred years they can still interbreed. After 200 years they might still having a little problem interbreeding. 500, 700 years later, they may not be able to interbreed. And I don't know why I'm doing this. <laughs> they might not be able to interbreed. <laughs> and then a new species has been born. So a species is created by what is basically a contingent reproductive barrier. It's called reproductive isolation. Reproductive isolation comes in degrees. We, for instance, we humans, are entirely reproductive isolated from chimpanzees, gorillas, uh, and other apes with whom we share a common ancestor not that long ago. But we have diverged so long that our eggs cannot be fertilized by their sperma and vice versa. Thank God. Horses and donkeys are reproductive isolated, but less so. First of all, they can still do it. Second, the, the horse's sperm can still fertilize the donkey's egg, but the end result, the offspring, will be a mule that is sterile, which means that the genes won't be able to pass any farther down. That is also reproductive isolation. Even though there is fertility, even though there is a the mechanical aspects of sexuality still there, the genes cannot go by Mon monkeys. Donkeys and horses are two different species. Now, that's the moment of birth. The moment of death is, of course, extinction. We are very familiar with that today because we humans send about a thousand different species to extinction every day. Not large tigers and beautiful furry animals, little insects and, 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 and so on, but we might miss them 50 years down the road if it turns out that one of those insects in this genome had the instructions to create a protein that happens to cure cancer, right? Today we can just, we just kill them, but we might regret it one day. At any rate, we are very familiar with the concept of extinction. What this means, having a date of birth and a date of birth, and a date of death, is that every species, the human species and others, are unique historical entities. Just like you and me, as individual organisms, or as individual persons, either way, we are unique, irreproducible. So are species. Someone can take your DNA and make a clone out of you. That clone is going to look exactly like you. But little difference in its embryological uh, development, little differences in its socialization in the family, then socialization at school and so on, will create divergent paths that even if your clone looks exactly like you and has the same fingerprints and everything, it will be two different persons. Nobody is going to believe that you have recreated the exact same individual. Individuals are unique and singular, hence my calling them individual singularities. Now we knew, since Aristotle, that individual singularities are accidental, that individual singularities have an accidental birth. You were born, but you could have not been born, and you, would, you died this day, but you could have died some other day. That was our lives are entirely contingent. He refused to theorize. But now that we know that so many other entities are individuals, we need to theorize. The human species, for instance, the only thing that guarantees our identity as a species is not some eternal essence floating above us, like Aristotle thought, because he called his essences formal causes. It is our historicity, it is our genealogical connection to all those chains of events that connect us to that point of divergence from other apes. Now, let me just give you an example of how contingent these reproductive barriers are, however strong they may be. There's today, today of course we understand perfectly well the genetic code. It is not a metaphor. If you hear somebody from science studies telling you, oh, it's just a metaphor, it's not just a metaphor, okay? A metaphor is when Roland Barthes used the word code. When, you, when, a, when a geneticist used the word code, they mean it just in the same sense as Morse code. In Morse code, you have a bunch of letters, A, B, C, you know, the letters of our English alphabet or, or some other Indo-European language, paired arbitrarily with long 
beeps and short beeps. So A would be two long beeps and one short beep, B, and so I don't know Morse code, so I'm totally making it up, but you know what I'm talking about. And that arbitrary pairing of letters from one alphabet to letters of another alphabet is what is called a code. Well, the genetic code is exactly like that. The genetic genes are built out of four different letters, that's a metaphor, some four different nucleotides, and proteins, the stuff that genes code for, are built out of 20 different letters, 20 different amino acids, that's also a metaphor. So what you need is, just like in, in the Morse code, you need to go from something that has two, short beep, long beep, to something that has 24, A, B, C, D, E, and so on, all the way to Z. Here you have to go for something that has four, to something that has 20. So you're gonna have to make those pairings, and the pairings are known. Every three nucleotides correspond to this one amino acid, entirely arbitrarily. It is not a convention, as in the case of the Morse code, it is a frozen accident, as the famous biologist Jack Monod once said. It just froze at some point during the history of humanity, and that's what it is, but we can tell it is, it is accidental because we can create designer genetic codes, and in fact they work. In other words, there are alternatives, and that is what pinpoints something that's arbitrary. Now that we know the genetic code, though, we can do all kinds of horrible things. For instance, we know that we value spider silk because spider silk, particularly the flagelli form that creates the structural engineering parts of a, of a spider web, you know, the, the, the one that sustains the web, is stronger than Kevlar. Not in one strand, of course, but if you weave them, just like, just like Kevlar, uh, you weave them into ropes, and those thin ropes, you weave them into thicker ropes, and then you create vests out of those thicker ropes, they can stop bullets better than Kevlar. So, wouldn't it be great to be able to just domesticate spiders and get them to produce silk? Yes, it would. Unfortunately, unlike a, a, a spider worms, which of course we domesticated, the Chinese domesticated a long, long time ago, and we've been extracting silk and, and processing and creating beautiful items out of for, for centuries, if not millennia, spiders are predators and predators are not as easy to, to domesticate. No one has been able to domesticate a spider, right? So, what do we do? Well, let's take spider silk, it's just a repeated protein over and over. We now know the code, so if you know one of the, one of the proteins, now it's a bunch of amino acids. You go, this amino acid, that's three nucleotides over here. This is another three nucleotides, that's another one. You can create a designer gene. Then you take that designer gene and you inject it into an animal that is not a predator, say, a goat. Now you might think that this is science fiction, but no. As we speak today in upstate New York, there's a factory that is producing spider silk out of goats, right? Now, at first I thought that when they, tr they put this spider genes into a goat, what the, the result was going to be spider goat. You know, like a goat dressed on, in, you know, with his uniform like red and black and shooting silk like this. Bah! Bah! No, that's not the way it works. All that happened is they, they put that gene into the mammary glands of the goat, not into its genome, so the goats can only pass the gene to future generations. The, 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 the gene gets expressed as part of the milk, pro, the milk production process. It's, it's, you, you can milk it out of the goat, then you chemically separate the lactose and all the elements of milk from the spider silk. You end up with a paste that you then take a a, a, a large metallic screen with tiny little holes in it, and you press it against the screen, out the other side comes extruded, yes, ladies and gentlemen, spider silk. And they are producing it right now. Now, I'm not going to get into the ethical aspects of this, genetic pollution and so on. All I'm saying right now is, we have violated a reproductive isolation between two species that are separated by millions and millions of years without giving it a second thought, right? We don't know the consequences of this. Just like we didn't know that fluorocarbons, all those things that we put in our sprays and our, and our hairspray and so on, we're going to create a hole in the ozone layer. Who even know that there was an ozone layer? Well, these things may come back to haunt us later on. I don't want to get into that, although it is obviously an important subject. The important subject is this. The reproductive isolation barrier between spiders and goats was clearly contingent. 
Otherwise, we would not have been able to breach it. We breached it, so it's not necessary. It's not something, you know, necessary things are things that you can think a priori, because they are logically necessary, just like, you know, Socrates is human, follows necessarily from all humans are mortal, and Socrates is human, Socrates is mortal, and when things are necessary, you can just think about it. But reproductive isolation is contingent, which means that species are unique historical individuals. And just like you cannot make a clone of yourself and claim it is yourself, if we send, for instance, zebras to extinction today, and sometime 2,000 years into the future, some other black and white camouflage horse-like creatures appear, well, those, are, those look like zebras, but they are not zebras. Zebras are dead if we send them to extinction. That is an ethical point, because if, zebra, if there was an essence of the zebra, at this level of Aristotle's thing, then well, we know that we're not going to kill that. All we're doing is killing all these actual zebras. But the essence of the zebra is up there, and it will be incarnated in the future. So we're not really doing that, nothing that bad. But if species are historical, then once you kill one species, it'll never come back again. Something like it might come back, but not that species. At any rate, that is where the concept of individual singularities come in. It used to be applied only to organisms and persons. Now it is applied to anything that has a history, as it should be. Individual communities, this community, that community, that small town, that ethnic neighborhood, with its own history. Individual cities, Venice, Genoa, Florence, Milan, each one with its own different history and unique trajectory and unique personality. They're individual cities, individual organizations. This university, that university, this hospital, that hospital, that prison, this other prison. Most actual entities, if not all, are in fact just individuals. Now this becomes a little harder to, to, to buy in the case of things like atoms. You know, wouldn't you say that all hydrogen atoms are exactly the same, and that therefore, if we use the Aristotelian thing, it would be the category would be atom. I mean, the genera would be atom, the species would be hydrogen. Clearly, Aristotle did not do this, he did do that, minus the silver thing, of course. And then this one atom. This is the way an Aristotelian today would break things down. Now, atoms, after all, have existed forever, and will probably exist forever, aren't they at least one example of Aristotle being right? Atoms are necessary, and hydrogen is necessarily an atom, and there's a necessary condition for a hydrogen atom to be hydrogen. What is that? To have a single proton in its nucleus. And how do we know that? Because if you add another proton to its nucleus, it becomes helium. You transform it into a, you, you change its identity. And therefore, its identity depends on its having only one atom. I mean, only one a, 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 a proton in its nucleus. Well, yeah, this, this is as close as you get to it, but it's nevertheless false. Every single atom that we have in our bodies, every single atom that makes up this world, was actually manufactured, just like species are manufactured, historically, in an entirely different way. It's called ke chemical evolution, not biological evolution, and occurs in an entirely different way. They don't have genes, they don't have ecosystems. But nevertheless, they are manufactured in stars and in cosmic events of that intensity. Our sun, which is a relatively small star, only manufactures helium, hydrogen and a relatively few amounts of oxygen and carbon. Larger stars in other, in other solar systems manufacture all the way to metals. And supernovas, explosions of, of, of dead stars, manufacture the heavier e e elements. It's a process called, more appropriately, nucleosynthesis. The synthesis of a nucleus. So whereas Aristotle would tell us, just, you know, take the nucleus for granted. It has always been that way. In this ontology, we always have to, to find the, the historical process that manufacture atoms one by one. Now, I don't want to sound like Lisa Minelli or anything, but we are all stardust. OK? 
Okay, every single atom in your body, every atom was manufactured in some star or another. It arrived in this planet by different means and eventually became part of your body because your mother ate some minerals and so on and eventually became part of your body. But we are all stardust. So that's, I think it's a very poetic thought, but it also historicizes atoms, which is a very important thing. It makes every atom of hydrogen an individual singularity, this one, that one, all of them are individuals existing in a very large population and having been born at a specific time within a star. Everything around us is historical. Now, let me go up here. One thing is to get rid of species. That's easy. How do you get rid of genera? One thing is to get rid of horses. How do you get rid of animals in general? That's tougher. This is why I need to bring a second category, universal singularities. Now, the term universal and the term general are used synonymously by most people. Aristotle uses them interchangeably in the metaphysics. In logical sense, Deleuze uses them interchangeably, although he does make a distinction which is again why I, w I wish I spoke French, so I could go and check the original to see whose fault this is. In Indifference and Repetition, he now establishes a distinction between the two. General is a logical category. As I said, it's a category that encompasses all humans are mortal. That's a general truth. Universality is from mathematics and refers to an entirely different thing, something that has nothing to do with logic, nothing to do with language. And here we're going to have to switch pages. Most of the work on, on universal singularities has been done by German mathematicians from the 18th and 19th centuries. That I'm going to mention the names right now. Euler, Gauss, Riemann, and a few French mathematicians. Uh, 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 I'm sorry, Gauss, uh, Riemann, uh, um, and uh, uh, Felix Klein, Another one of the greatest mathematicians of the 19th century, very much ignored by people because of our trauma from high school. But just get over it, for God's sakes, right? Yeah, it was hell. But mathematics is beautiful, and particularly when you get it from the masters, from the Felix Klein, from the, from the, from the uh, uh, Riemanns, who, who clearly invented new things that even Kant would have been odd because they, they were the things that were contradicting his synthetic a priori, and nevertheless, I'll bet you he would have been appreciative of it. I mean, he would have... I can't believe I couldn't think of this. I can't believe that you guys came and invented this thing, you know, that all of a sudden took 2,500 years of tradition and sent it to, to, to the back burn. So let's begin with the term singularity. which I used it in two of my terms, universal singularity, individual singularity. Now the word singular has two meanings and we need to distinguish them. In one meaning is singular versus plural, one versus many. That is not the meaning we're talking about here. Remember for the loss, everything is many. This is why, speaking of reproductive communities that give rise to species, it's a very Deleuzean thing because you're already thinking with populations. And this is why think, thinking about populations of hydrogen atoms as opposed to hydrogen in general is a very Deleuzean thing because a population of individual atoms, not hydrogen in general, which immediately would bring us back to Aristotle. So singularity has a second meaning. It's singular versus ordinary. It's, it's synonymous with remarkable, with unique, but unique not in the sense of there being only one. There can be many of them in the sense of being non-reproducible because it's a historical, you know, haxiety. So, singularities exist in mathematics in a variety of ways, and they were discovered, at least discovered for our modernist times by Lerner, I'm not even going to try to pronounce it, the, the first name in German, Euler, one of the greatest mathematicians of all times. Euler took a piece of software that had been invented before him by both Newton and Leibniz. Newton and Leibniz became long life, you know, lifelong rather enemies because they both invented this piece of software at the same time. 
And because science is open source, in the sense that you don't have to pay the family of Newton every time you use his equations, right? You just grab them off a block. And when it's open source, it means it is, you know, that the currency is credit. You're not getting any money from this. You're getting just credit. And when credit is the only uh, uh, commodity that circulates in, a, in, a, in, a, in an interpersonal network, you want to get the credit. You don't want to give the credit to somebody else. In this particular case, there were two geniuses. Leibniz on the one hand, Newton on the other hand. And they both invented the same thing. Retrospectively, we can tell it was the same thing. It's called the differential calculus. And the differential calculus is a very interesting piece of mathematics. At the end of the 19th century, people thought the differential calculus had been reduced to arithmetic. And then at the beginning of the 20th century, they reduced arithmetic to, uh, to logic. And so for the first half of the 20th century, we did not even think about these things because who cares? Everything has already been reduced to logic. Let's just all use logic. Until another famous German mathematician, Gerdell, Goodell, Goodell, Goodell. See, you guys have these names that are unpronounceable. What do you want me to do? You know, I want you to pronounce, out, well, I'm going to tell you that, that, that later. He proved, of course, in the middle of the 20th century, that arithmetic, arithmetic was not reducible to logic, and therefore reopened the debate completely. But even if Goodell had not existed, mathematicians continued to invent new mathematics, oblivious to the fact that their discipline was supposedly had been reduced to logic. And today, at the end, at the beginning of the 21st century, we know that that was a dream of late 19th century mathematicians. It was never reduced to logic. Right? Mathematics has a life of its own. So Euler took a piece of mathematics, took an algorithm, a piece of software invented by Leibniz and Newton, the differential calculus, which I'm just going to explain very, very fast what it does. The differential calculus, just like any mathematical operator, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction, you need something that comes as an input, say two numbers to the addition operator, two and three, and it gives you an output, five, right? Well, the operator is as the two numbers. Or multiplication, two and five, and it gives you an output, ten. So all we need to know is what comes in as an out input, what goes out as an output. We don't have, for the sake of this conversation, figure out how it does it. The, the, the operators of the calculus, one of, one of them is differentiation. He takes as an input an equation called a rate of change. Now, we all heard that expression, but precisely because they explained it to us so badly, we don't really get this, how sexy that expression is. Let me give you a synonym, which will make it a lot more sexy. This is, it's a speed of becoming. That's what a rate of change is. Is the, is the, the slowness or rapidity with which something is changing relative to itself. It's, it's, is a, is a speed of becoming. And that is a very important thing. And what the calculus does is you feed it on one side the speed of becoming, and on the, only one, on the other side it gives you the instantaneous value for that becoming at any one particular point in time. Let me give you an example. Say that you are a forensic doctor and you have a corpse in front of you with a bullet hole in his head. Poor guy, he died instantaneously. He must have not suffered much except the expression. I don't know about that. Now, you want to know how far away the guy who shot him was, right? So you know the bullet, you extracted the bullet, and it, oh yeah, well, it's a such and such caliber gun. I know what the gun is. So you take the manual, and the manual, they tell you, on average, this bullet travels at 50 miles per hour. I don't know, right? But it is, that's a rate of change the rate of change of position with respect to time. It's a very simple becoming, but it's a becoming. It's the becomings involved in motion. But you don't want to know that. You don't want to know the average speed of the bullet. You want to know at what speed was the bullet going exactly before it hit the guy in the head. That is, at that instant, that before the wound started becoming wound, what, you know, at that very instant, and then all you have to do is feed that speed of becoming into the calculus operators, and it gives you the right answer. So it has practical applications, not only the goofy one I just gave you, but in, in reality. So Euler 
Newton, of course, invented it, and Leibniz invented it, and they both invented it to study astronomical problems. Euler, what he did, is something even more important. He went beyond the equations. He said, forget about the equations, forget about the actual formal apparatus. Let's just investigate the space of possibilities associated with the equations, and let's see if he has any structure at all. And if he has special, unique, remarkable points in it, in, in which we know everything is going to end up anyway. Let me give you a, a, a very concrete example, not one from Euler. Let me, uh, I'm going to create a space here, and I'm going to make it, he was Euclidean, although in reality they are not Euclidean. And I'm going to put a singularity here in the form of a point. All of these other points are also possibilities. But only this one is a singularity. And then you take a phenomenon like a soap bubble. Now, everybody has seen soap bubbles, right? They are very simple. Do you take a piece of soap film and a piece of wire, you blow through it, out comes a perfect sphere. Now that by itself, if you think about it, is pretty amazing because the spheres are not easy to make. Everybody that has ever made a sphere out of wood or metal knows that spheres are tough, and yet soap bubbles just come out by themselves, right? Now, if you get a dodecahedral soap bubble one day blowing the thing, I'll bet you you'll be scared to death. I'll bet you you have to go home and change your shorts, right? Because a dodecahedral, or a triangular soap bubble, oh my God, I can't see that. How? Does the millions of molecules in soap film find that form so easily, so instantaneously? But Euler would say, all those little guys become attracted to the form of a sphere because the form of the sphere is the one that minimizes the tension at the surface of the sphere. Now, a point of minimum tension is singularity. Those are the types of, the type of singularities that Euler discovered. Minima and maxima. And Euler would tell you, I can explain to you why it's always a sphere. Because in its space of possibilities, there is a singularity, which is a minimum, that acts as an attractor for all the possibilities. It doesn't matter where you start in the space, it will end up over there. So the Euler brilliant insight, we're talking about the middle of the 18th century, was that you could, you could see in advance what shape something is going to take simply by looking at its space of possibilities, simply by looking at its universal singularities. And more than that, a universal singularity doesn't just produce one form, it produces many different forms. Think, for instance, of a crystal of common table salt, which has sodium atoms on the corner, you know, it's sodium chloride, chloride, and a chlorine atom in the middle. Now, every time you put sodium and chlorine in the same solution, they get attracted to the cubic form. Now, if you, if you don't believe me, you take a little bit of that table salt, pulverize it and put it under a microscope and when you, what you're going to see are perfect little cubes. Right? Now, those guys become a cube also because they are minimizing bonding energy. In other words, they have the same singularity, a minimum, in their space of possibilities. Euler in the 18th century understood this and Deleuze understood that this was the way to get out of the general and the particular. Because when you are talking about essences, when you are talking about the essence of a zebra subsisting eternally, and not as opposed to accidentally and necessarily, you are saying that between the actual zebras in the wild and that archetype zebra, so to speak, there is a relationship of resemblance. You know, actual zebras resemble the ideal zebra to a lesser degree, it is that variation in the zebras that, 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 that fogs this for us. If we could see clearly, we would just see the perfect zebra and the imperfections in the resemblance of the actual zebras. But what, what Deleuze saw when he began, he began to study these things is that 
with universal singularities do not resemble at all the shapes that they give rise to. They can give rise to spheres, they can give rise to cubes, they can give rise to straight lines, as in the case of light. Light also follows a path that, that is the minimum distance, or the path that takes the minimum amount of time, which means that they are basically also talking about a point singularity. Now, if this had been it, it would not have been that much fun. But later came on another mathematician. His name is André Poincaré. There is some kind of accent somewhere in there. I don't know where it is. <laughs> but he has it, he has it. He lived, of course, at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. He was perhaps the last mathematician who could, con who could make uh, good contributions to every single subfield of mathematics ever since Mathematics has become a lot more disjointed, much more over-specialized. Poincaré was the last overall genius. And he discovered that there are all kinds of other different singularities. He discovered, for instance, singularities that have this form. They are lines instead of points, and they are closed like a loop. That they also have that capacity to attract things. And soon after he discovered them, we began to realize that radio transmitters <laughs> that's my version of a radio transmitter let me put a little bit dial for a little better yeah. radio transmitters do what they do you know transmitters not receivers right because when you connect them to the wall and you turn them on they begin pulsating to a perfect beat and generate spherical with every beat they generate a spherical electromagnetic wave one after the other, and that series of spherical waves is what we call the signal, right? When you take your cell phone and you're looking for a signal, you're looking for those waves. On top of those spheres of electromagnetic energy, we can then modulate either the frequency or the amplitude, and you can get AM radio or FM radio, depending on what you modulate, the frequency or the amplitude, and send messages piggybacked on the signal. So if you don't have the signal, you cannot send any messages, as anybody who has tried to find the signal with a cell phone knows. You, cannot, you first need to get the signal, and then you make the phone call. Well, that signal is produced by the perfect beat. And when you go into the radio transmitter and try to figure out where the perfect beat is, you realize that there's not a circuit or a thing that is called a perfect beat. The perfect beat emerges spontaneously as the dynamics of the circuits and the electricity within the radio are attracted to a singularity that has the form of a loop. It's called a periodic singularity. It was discovered by Poincaré. So he began to add things to Euler. To us this is important because that means that singularities are an empirical matter that we can discover newer and newer singularities as we begin to explore newer and newer phenomena. In other words, you cannot say things a priori about singularities. Knowledge about universal singularities, even though they are abstract entities, continues to be a posteriori. You actually need to do the work and gather the mathematical evidence for their existence. Many other things happen to be like that. Your heart, for instance. It beats at a perfect beat. You can take some of the cardiac cells out and put them in a Petri dish and they continue to beat at a perfect beat. And yet there is not one single thing in there that says, this is a clock, this is what's producing the beat. The beat emerges just like the soap ball emerges spontaneously by virtue of the fact that in the spaces of possibilities, there is that kind of singularity. I'm getting to an end now. Poincaré also saw, although he kind of was horrified by it, what we today call a chaotic attractor. I'm going to draw one of them. That's called the Lorentz attractor after an American, or they happen to have a German name. A Lorentz, Lorentz was a meteorologist. He discovered that type of singularity in the 1960s. They are called chaotic attractors, but that is a misnomer. There's nothing chaotic about it. If you don't believe me, you know, look up when, when you get to the Wi-Fi hotspot, 
Google Lorenz attractor and, and try to get at least a three-dimensional version. You know, Google is going to give you all kinds of images. Get an, a three-dimensional version rotating and you tell me if that looks chaotic at all. It looks weird, it looks complex, but it doesn't look chaotic. It looks intriguing. It has an aesthetic properly to it. A better term would have been fractal attractors because they do have that cell similarity at different, at different scales. Nevertheless, the very fact that we call them chaotic shows that we were scared about them. But there's nothing to be scared. A chaotic attractor produces order. It doesn't produce chaos. Chaos would be produced in a space that had no singularities in it. Because a space with no singularities, the trajectories that, that, that represent the history of a system would just wander around and around and around, and that's random. But if all of them get attracted, to a Lorentz attractor, it doesn't matter how many little you know, drift it does, eventually comes here and wraps itself around in a very small portion of the space of possibilities, and that is order. Now I'm not going to start giving you examples right now because this one we just discovered, we're just beginning to see what systems in reality have chaotic attractors. Let me move on because I need to finish this. Let me get back to the beginning of the talk. The beginning of the talk I said that capacities are different than properties because capacities are virtual when they are not being actually exercised and even when they are actually being exercised they are not <coughs> static states they are dynamic events that are doubled to cut to be cut and so the most important philosophical concept to think about capacities or tendencies to different things but similar you know, something has a, you know, water we know has a tendency to become ice the moment it gets to zero degrees centigrade. It spontaneously organizes itself into crystals. Or at 100 degrees centigrade, it spontaneously becomes vapor, becomes steam. Now that's a tendency. But let's assume that we have a volume of water here that never gets to 100 degrees and never gets to zero degrees. So it never gets to be ice, never gets to be steam. Nevertheless, that tendency to be ice and the tendency to be steam is real. It's just virtual, potential. Right? So Deleuze, very early on, and this is because he borrowed this from Spinoza and Leibniz, this is something that has been known forever. They might use different terms like dispositions, but nevertheless, as far back as Aristotle, we know how to theorize potentialities. What we didn't have is the math to make them into formal objects that could now be studied formally. It's thanks to Euler, thanks to uh, Poincaré, thanks to mathematicians like that, that today we have the apparatus needed to think about tendencies. All, we, we can explain cell bubbles, we can explain crystals, we can explain radio transmitters and their tendency to, 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 to beat like that. We still don't have the mathematics or any formal apparatus to think about capacities. The capacity of the knife to cut, the capacity to kill, the capacity to put a threatening note. And the, the reason why is that those spaces are infinite. And they depend, they are relational. They are couplings of spaces. The space of the knife with the space of the fruit that is cutting. The space of the knife with the space of the animal that is killing. The space of the knife with the space of the note that is, you know, threatening on the door. And so we still don't know how to do that. Mathematicians are working on it. Nevertheless, they are using the insights we develop in the, in, the, in, the, in the study of tendencies. Deleuze was relatively young in the early 60s when these ideas were in the air in Paris. Uh, Mandelbrot, who is the father of fractals, as everybody knows, he was still in Paris. He had not been moved yet to the United States to become you know, the fractal guy. He was still you know, uh, uh, gathering fractals as, as, as part of a freak show, all the different curves and entities in mathematics that, nobody, that, that, that people think are freakish, that no one knows how to classify. He was still putting together his freak show, nevertheless attracting a lot of attention. The modern or the contemporary descendant of Poincaré, his name is René Tom. I don't want to... I'm tired of page. Okay, so let's put here. Poincaré did not have that many disciples, although there are, in fact, but René Tom, and this also has an accent somewhere. René Tom, father of catastrophe theory, which is again the grandfather of chaos theory, 
he began to put Euler and Poincaré together and he was teaching in Paris. So in the first half of the 60s, these ideas were in the air in Paris, but only in Paris. Poincaré's book had not been translated into English or very badly and, and they were not available, so American philosophers did not have access to these ideas. And so it, it took a French guy who was, who was not only had the opportunity, but also had the genius to take advantage of the opportunity to put all these things together and for the first time create a scape route from the Aristotelian metaphysics. You know, I, I've only explained a little bit of it today, but never, you know, I, I have a lot more in my own books, a lot more examples and so on. But the point here is that it, it was going to take a major leap of the imagination to go to, to, to to do something better than, than, than what had been done 2,500 years before. Deleuze by himself probably would not have been able to do it. He took advantage of the fact that, that Spinoza, Leibniz, and in, in, to a certain extent Nietzsche, and particularly Bergson, and in, to a certain extent Husserl too, who also studied mathematics and studied the difference between you know, a, 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 a metric geometries and non-metric geometries. He took a lot of that, but he is the one who actually put it in the form of a philosophy. His entire philosophy does not depend on the general and the particular. Now, there's just one more thing to finish the conversation. Why does this have consequences? Well, in my own work, I'll tell you what the consequences are, and I'm going to switch now to social science to make the point. In my own work, I have found, and this is not something where, the, you know, the Lou sometimes is not quite clear about this, we cannot blame him. Because the guy who, makes the, who does the first shot, the first stab at something, he has to miss a few things. He's counting on us to add all the little details and fix the imperfections and, 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 and create something on top of it. Right? So we cannot blame him. He already made the, the, the most important step. So in my own work, I've come to believe that anything that is a general term that has been reified, that is, that has been postulated to exist, is in fact an obstacle to thought. What terms are that like that? Well, think about the market, or the state, or the American people, or men, or women, no, woman, right? I mean, you know, mankind in general, the market in general, the state in general, as opposed to do what Foucault say he did in Discipline and Punish. I'm going to study a population of organizations, not the hospital, but many hospitals, not the prison, but many prisons, many schools. I'm going to see in a very specific period of time, the 17th and 18th centuries, how prisons, schools, factories, barracks, and uh, hospitals changed from being places in which, places of confinement but where you could not really learn, you, you could not extract knowledge from the patients, the prisoners, the students, into the kinds of places where you, when you distribute analytically the bodies of patients, each one pinned to his bed, the bodies of students, each one pinned to his chair, and you not only police them and monitor them much more carefully, but you keep records on them. Remember that prior to the Napoleonic secret police that invented the dossier, regular people did not have biographies. If you, were, if you were going to have a biography, you need to be a famous person. The idea of everybody with records, driving records, insurance records, medical records, school records, and so on, was born from that transformation. But Foucault discovered that not by studying the state, or the market, or the discipline in general, or the power, although sometimes he's a little funny about that, but by studying an actual population of individual singularities, and then studying the possibility spaces of those singular. Then it has very concrete consequences for as long as we keep thinking with reified generalities. You know, the left or, or leftists demonizing the market and glorifying the state, and then you go to the Tea Party people who, you know, you know everybody knows the Tea Party people, right? Like a bunch of freaking readers running around, and chickens without their head cut off demonizing the, the, the state and glorifying the market. Where are we going to get that way? We need to switch to a, a way of thinking in which we think about institutional organizations as individual singularities 
And then we, like Max Weber did a long time ago, begin to study the spaces of possibilities associated with them. Max Weber a long time ago said, all of those institutions, hospitals, schools, universities, prisons, have an authority structure. So what is the possibility space for the legitimacy of that authority? Well, there's a singularity there that shows you charisma as a source of legitimacy. There's another singularity which occurs in ecclesiastical organizations, uh, uh, um, aristocratic organizations, which is tradition as a source of, 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 of uh, legitimacy. Then it's newer organizations like industrial corporations, uh, uh, bureaucracies, that it is the, the fact that they can get things done that gives them legitimacy. You know, if you are like FEMA and you cannot rescue the people from New Orleans during Katrina after five days, you lose legitimacy. It doesn't matter what tradition you come from, it doesn't matter what you do, right? So he was able to go, bring us back to the concrete, to concrete populations of individual entities so that we can stop thinking in terms of vague abstractions and start confronting history in terms of singularities, both individual and universal. And it is my belief that only by confronting history like that can we recover the richness of the concrete and not let it slip back, not let it be diluted by the, by the vagueness of the general abstract. Thank you very much. So, thank you, Manuel, that you gave us the lecture for two years, <laughs> <laughs> 45 minutes is your time, not one and a half hours. So I will stop I talking and I will give you 15 minutes of discussion, please. Yes. Thank you so much. So um, I wanted to ask you about uh, something which comes in between you know, Aristotle and Deleuze. You skip across many things, which is uh, curse and abduction. So somebody told me, I don't know if it's true, but it's a very attractive idea, but the idea of abduction is trying to capture a third way to produce knowledge and to stay true, or to discover true, which is uh, seeing patterns right, in, in, in data, right, which is, of course, a very contemporary idea, and which, which in fact emerged as a major way to do knowledge discovery today. So what would you, how do you fit this in, or well, what, what is all? Okay, I'm not going to comment on peers specifically yeah, because, but, 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 I, but I understand. Do, I do understand your point. I mean, he did. Uh, he did add something to induction and, and deduction. You're absolutely right. But we were talking about this early on in the in the uh, in the dinner table, uh, when we said we were talking about how, you know, when you study populations, and of course, with individual singularities, they're always coming populations, right? What you're interested in is not what do they have the same between them, that would be the Aristotelian essence, right? You want to find what do they share in common, right? But we want to know how is the variation distributed in the variation, in, in the population, right? And now I do have to use some of And the variation could be a very, very simple Gaussian, like you mentioned during dinner, you know, which has a, a, a large average and relatively short tails, right? But it also can be what is called a long tail distribution, in which there's a few large cities, a, a few more medium-sized cities, and a lot of teeny-weeny little cities, right? There are many, many statistical distributions. But of course, the statistics is part and parcel of the studying of individual singularities, because individual singularities always come in populations. And what you want to know is how the, is the variation distributed in the population. Remember that for Aristotle, Variation was a nuisance. It was something that doesn't allow you to see the perfect zebra. Mm -hmm. Whereas we know today that if zebras did not contain variation in their genome, they would have never evolved. In other words, variation is of the essence, if you want to put it that way. But from a theoretical point of view, statistical curves are extremely important, right? Which, and which is what you, what, when you're doing, when you're doing data mining, what you're trying to do with, by saying, how do we extract knowledge, not data mining per, per se, but how do we produce knowledge from, from uh, data sets that are enormous? What you're basically saying is that, right? We have all this data about all these populations, about all these individual singularities, and what we want to know is, can we detect trends, that is, tendencies, right? 
And that is precisely what I'm, what I'm doing here. Uh, you, uh, you're, you're, I'm detecting trends or tendencies by locating singularities, but that doesn't have to be done that way. It can be done your way. It can be done the statistical way, right? And that's why statistics is very important. Two nights later, okay? Then you can go on to see the sky. Students! Yeah. Uh, is, is mathematics a language for you? And if it's not, uh, what is it exempt? What does it exempt it from this study? Well, mathematics is a language, but it's, I mean, it's not really a language in the sense in, this, in, the sense in which language is a language. It's not composed in the same way. But, or, or you want to put it the other way, language can be a kind of mathematical entity. Either way, what is important is what you can do with it, right? So, normally we think of language as language for representing things. But there are philosophers who have thought about language as, as, as something that you do things with. Remember Austin, the famous British philosopher who wrote a book, How to Do Things with Words, in which he was talking about the performative aspect of language. What kinds of things can you do? You can make promises, you can make bets, you can make threats, you can state facts, you can get married. Do you marry this woman? Yes, that's language, but it's not just language. It's what is called a speech act. Right? It's a performative. Right? So mathematics, when you look at them in a piece of paper and you look language in a piece of paper, they both look at just symbols. <coughs> when you run them, language in society, you know, I promise I will do this, but I will pay big back this favor. I'm stating that this is the truth. When, you're, when you see language in action, doing things, and when you see mathematics in action, rotating objects or doing whatever, they begin to look like one another, but at the performative level, right? At the symbolic level, they have extremely different structures. They don't have the same rules of combination. They don't have the same kinds of operators. Uh, one is more like logic, the other one is less like logic, but at the performative level, mathematics doing things and language doing things, they do begin to look alike. Yeah, th that's also the reason why I asked. Can I? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. You, can, you can have a discussion in yeah, okay. class. Right, go on. Um, thank you so much for your, your presentation. It was absolutely wonderful. Um, I, to share, and, and ask, I guess, a question around your, your closing comments around language, and a little bit of a tweak to the Marxists and so on, which uh, I very much can, can understand. We actually are beginning to use your work in Deleuze in the world of global, global systemic risk. Um, and, you know, looking at this, the, the, the attractors and such. And I'm, I'm really curious, you know, in, in, in our case, you know, we, we see the recreation of the disaster. Paul Virilio is, is, a, is a profound influence there of, of how our systems, our structures tend to create or, or be attracted uh, to the recreation of the disaster. When you closed and talked about language and the universalization of language, capital, you know, the state, etc., what are, what are your thoughts or recommendations as to how we begin to change thinking uh, around this so, so more people are resonant to this kind of thinking so we can, you know, affect that, 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 that in, our, in our systems? Well, in the case of the accident, it clearly is a capacity. I mean, it is, what you're saying there is basically a car, for instance, the perfect example of, of an object that can't end up in a wreck of metal and glass of the type that Virilio uh, used to like. It is part is in the space of possibilities of a car, it's one of its capacities, that it collides with other cars, it collides with a rigid object, and it can become distorted to the point where you kill everybody inside. It is also the car that, in a hit and run type of thing, can kill somebody, right? Those are cars are normally sold to you through some of their capacities, their capacity to take you from point A to point B. They never tell you all the other capacities that the car has, right? So I, I would say that virtual philosophy, or a philosophy attuned to questions about capacities and tendencies, will be perfect to be able to, 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 to visualize that. Right? And then, in terms of risk assessment and, and uh, you know, a, a opportunities and risks are in general virtual entities. Right? This is why there can be missed opportunities and avoided risks. Right? So a, a good thinker is always, not, is always thinking not just in terms of the actual state of affairs that I'm seeing right now, but what virtual opportunities are there here for me? or for my speech, or for my action, uh, what risks are there here for me? All those risks and opportunities are virtual until they become manifested, until they become actualized, right? So 
a philosophy that educates you about thinking not only in terms of actual things, but also in terms of the virtual spaces that are associated with, the, with those actual things, right? It's a philosophy that is, is telling you that opportunities and risks are real, even if they are not actual, and that they can be assessed with the same kind of rigor as actual states of affairs. So, the, and therefore, we can evaluate the risk of global warming, the risk of new epidemics as, 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 as climate change, malaria will move, more, will move north. A lot of the people doing simulations today to try to understand what would happen if global warming took place, well, they are basically trying to map that possibility space, right? They try to map what our possible futures are and to see how can we avoid going certain paths and what, how, how, can we, how can we take the paths that are less risky, right? I would argue, and, and, and someone like uh, Jay Gibson, which uh, studies animal perception, that the perception of animals is all about locating opportunities and risks in what they see in an ecosystem. A regular animal does not approach a cliff and without seeing a risk of falling. The majority of animals stay clear of the cliff even if they had never fallen down, which means that they are not perceiving just a surface layout, they are perceiving a surface la layout pregnant with possibilities, in this case, bad possibilities for you. Right? The only animal that doesn't do that is Wiley Coyote. Wiley Coyote steps right up the cliff, and as long as he's not conscious that he's in midair, he doesn't fall down. But believe me, most animals are not like Wiley Coyote. Okay. Next animal. I want a female animal, please. <laughs> Come on, females. You are half of a deer. No question to him? Not even you are a teeny little question. This metro guy? Come on. Kick his ass. <laughs> <laughs> then if not, goodbye. <laughs>